All right, it's opening night for the New Orleans Pelicans. What are our expectations for the season? How much point Zion will we see tonight? What are the keys to beating Memphis? Will Guillory of The Athletic is here to help me break it all down. It's a Wednesday episode of Locked on Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked on Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans and NBA, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Pelicans Insider, credential member of the media, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. I got Will Guillory of The Athletic here to help me break down the, the season opener. It's it, As you said before we recorded, it's Pel's preview like week, something Hello, like that. Man. Pels preview week, man. This is the time of this is tis the season. Come on, man. This is this is what we really get into it. It's before it's nice all the, to have the, like the depressing stuff comes crashing down on us. This is when we can be <laughs> optimistic and hope for the best. There's already injuries though. They're gonna be yeah, three, I guess, three yeah. guys on it's opening night. On early on us, I guess this year. <laughs> this is the most like Pelicans thing ever. We'll get into that a little bit in the third segment <laughs> of today's show. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast coming to y'all after the game tonight. I'm gonna go live on the YouTube page the second that game's done. We're gonna be live doing a live show with instant reaction here. So, well, let's let's jump right right into it what, like is this team better or worse than last season oh that's a good way of starting i think they would say just off the strength of continuity just another year together another year with willie green in place i think they would say they're better and i think the hope is with the addition of james borrego which is something we're obviously going to get into i think they would say just an improved offense and improved offensive mentality approach i think would lead the, to them being better but I mean, we, we know the conversation here. It's they'll be better as long as they're healthy. If they got their best yeah. players in jerseys playing basketball, they'll be good. If not, it'll be rough probably again. Um, but I think I think they've made the right move this year as far as leaning into continuity, not any, making any drastic moves. Uh, I think there's and we saw there's, we saw there's value in continuity. Just look at the NBA champs, right? Uh, that, that Denver team had plenty of reasons to break up that team, make some for like moves, a couple of years, time. right? Could have, and they chose not to. And you see what the, the fruits of their labor eventually paid off. Once those guys were all healthy and ready to contribute, they made their run. And I think the Pels, I mean, championship is still a little bit early for this group, but I think their hope is having the these guys with a few years under their belt together understanding each other, understand Willie Green. I think they feel like they can build on that and hopefully put some more wins under their belt with improved health. But we'll see about that last part. I mean, do you expect Zion to play 60, 65 games? Same for Brandon Ingram. How are you, you know, if you had to kind of guess on it, you know, right now, as I put you on the spot, I, <laughs> to, <laughs> what, what would you say? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, with Zion, I think even beyond injuries, if we're going to have a conversation about Zion, mm -hmm. uh, I think what he needs to prove is his ability just to hit adversity and push through. Uh, I think what we've seen several times through his career is not just the injuries, but being injured and not being able to come back, right? Seeing a, yeah. Having that timeline in place and then blowing completely past it, adding two, three months to the timeline, it has been the issue with him. So I think the fight for him is not just staying healthy, but showing a healthy ability to fight through adversity, to, to, to have tough times hit because it's an 82 game season. It's a long season. He's going to have bumps and bruises. There are going to be times where he twists his ankle or he has a hard fall. We know his style of play is rough and rugged. So he's going to have times where he's a little beat up, but he's got to be able to push through and play and not have other circumstances hold him back or not be out for two weeks and need another two weeks to get himself in shape. Uh, so I think that's the big thing for him is having that ability to fight through adversity. Uh, me, I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. Just I like it. I like the optimism here. So I'm, I'm coming in with the belief that they're going to finally figure this thing out. That they got some years under their belt together. And I think you've been around a little bit just seeing Z. It seems like he just got a different look in his eye this year as far as just wanting to prove people wrong. I think for much of his career, it was about proving people right. I think this year for the first time for him, it's proving people wrong. 
uh, is kind of addressing all of the stuff that he can't do this, he can't do that. I think he's got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder this season that he wants to prove everybody wrong. And, and listen, it's not fun for me because I love good <laughs> quotes from Zion Williamson, but <laughs> right. at least for him playing 65 games, I'm all here for it. No, you know, at media day, he was just very different, I thought, right? Like, I I, had, I, I, I agreed with you that he just is kind of all business-like. He wasn't as, like, happy-go-lucky as he normally is. You weren't seeing, like, the smile from him on media day. And if that means he's got a different mindset that's going to help him battle through that adversity, and that's something I pointed out regularly on my show here, that's a, re- a really good thing because that's kind of what this season, I think, comes down to it. Let me ask you this when it comes to Zion. You know, he had – we don't need to get into this too much – like some bad press over over the summer here you know (laughs) to say the least you know it sounds like he is looking or has found like people to have his back in a way that he didn't need before because he was so good and when i spoke to him i got him for a little bit one-on-one on media day you know and i asked him about how the pelicans listened to him at the end of the season and made changes to the player performance and care team that seemed to like really matter to him and i wonder if and I'm, I'm curious your take on this. You know, maybe he saw with all that bad press and everything over the summer, like the Pelicans truly are looking out for him. They're listening to him. Do you think that's something that went into kind of his mentality in what we'll see, you know, tonight on opening night? Yeah, I think there's they're, basically since Zion came to town, there's constantly been a, a tug of war between him and the front office about making sure they're on the right page, having an understanding about what it takes to, to make sure he's in the right situation and make sure the right people are around him. And I thought it was very interesting that Trajan Langdon and David Griffin came out on media day and said, yeah, we made changes to the medical staff because the players said they wanted to see changes on the medical staff, which isn't something we've heard very often from David Griffin because if anything, at the end of last season, what David Griffin said is, I don't want everybody blaming everything on the medical staff. I don't want people saying that's the reason why guys are hurt. That's the problem is the medical staff. And then they changed their tune once the new season came around. They said, hey, the guys who said they want to change and we made we acquiesced. And I don't think it was just Zion. I think no, uh, for people that think I agree. It, it was it wasn't just Zion. I had a problem with some of the people on the medical staff. I can tell you that for a fact, that it was more than just him that wanted to see changes on the medical staff. So I think, A, that's a good thing that the, the front office listened to the players and they were willing to make those changes. But also it puts the onus on those players to, okay, we gave you what you want. Now you've got to produce. Now you've got to be there. You've got to be available. You've got to be able to fight through those injuries. You've got to be able to work with this new medical staff in a way where there was, you know, kind of a, a has not a hesitant, obviously beyond a hesitation. There was a flat out, I don't want to work with this guy type mentality with the, the previous medical staff, the way it was in place. And I think now uh, there's a much greater comfort level with the way things are organized, with the way it's more of a, a team effort where it kind of all ran through Aaron Nelson previously. And I also think that for Zion, again, it's constantly a tug, a tug and pull between him and the front office about what they need to do to make sure he's in the right position, what he needs to do to make sure he's in the right position. And I think the most important thing, what we heard from media day was that there was actual communication between the two sides, because if anything, through the first few seasons between these side, what we heard was the communication was lacking or mm-hmm. that they weren't talking. They, they were just constantly beefing all the time. And it was, he said, she said type of stuff going on behind the scenes and sniping at, at each other through the media. And that's where things really gets ugly and so i think what we've heard now consistently is that the dialogue is much more present between the two sides than it has been in the past and i think there's a different level of commitment from zion not just to be in shape because he was in shape last year when he came into camp no he looked great (laughs) yeah and i think he looks really good right now you saw you know in the orlando game he looked great in that game but i think there needs to be a constant communication between the two sides and an understanding of where the two sides come from because because i mean just talking to the two sides throughout these four, four or five years they've been together i think what i've constantly uh come to is that there's just a uh it was just a lack of understanding between the two sides it wasn't that hey we're talking and we're not agreeing it's that we're not talking and i think he thinks this and i don't like that he thinks this and he thinks that and i don't like the fact that he thinks that and now it's more of a a, a communication between the two sides they understand each other they don't always agree i can tell you that much but i think that the yeah, fact that's that they're okay. communicating is a, is a positive step 
Yeah, that uh, it's, I think wait, if you're looking for reasons for optimism, you know, the roster is kind of largely the same as it was last year. You still have Willie Green as a head coach, but you've nailed it, right? Like the kind of maybe a bit, a little bit of a better buy in from the players, James Borrego. Let's get into that coming up next. Talk about the offense. Start to talk about this game tonight against the Memphis Grizzlies. That's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Right now, though, I'm excited to tell you about Prize Picks because Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Prize Picks is a skill based, real money daily fantasy sports game. So, how does it work? You pick two to six players, and if they go score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. And Prize Picks adds a ton of excitement to the sports viewing experience. You get to watch your progress update in real time, win up to 25 times your entry, and cash out your winnings with quick scoring, settling, and with draws tonight i'm taking zion williamson to have more than 25 and a half points brandon ingram to have more than five and a half assists i'm feeling confident about the offense will and i will talk about that coming up here in just a moment so if you want to get in on this go to prizepicks.com slash locked on nba and use code locked on nba for a first deposit match up to 100 that's free money right there again get 100 extra on top of your deposit go to prizepicks.com slash locked on nba use code locked on nba Price picks, it's daily fantasy sports made easy. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are here Monday through Friday for y'all, breaking down everything you want to know about this team, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Don't forget, live show right after the game. Win, lose, we're going to go live, break it all down here on the Locked On Pelicans YouTube page, so subscribe. We're talking with Will Guillory of The Athletic here all right, offense time. This is what everyone wants to see, right? Like, this is what, what a lot of the season comes down to. There was a lot made about hiring James Borrego. That's, you know, coming into... Willie Green tried to downplay it at Media Day, I thought. He's kind of say, we're re, you know, we're not rebuilding, we're not retooling, we're just tweaking things. And then everything they're trying to do is, like, very different than what exactly. they did. <laughs> like, yes. entirely different <laughs> than what they're doing last year. You know... There were flashes of it, I thought, at times in preseason, but overall it seemed a little clunky. How are you feeling about the offense going into this game against Memphis? No, I think flat out that it was rough at times during the preseason. Okay. Let's just be frank. Uh, I mean, that that Houston game, that Atlanta game, it was really bad, especially during the stretches when the starters were out there. And I think you mentioned it. It's because they're asking these guys to kind of get out of their comfort zone in multiple ways, especially with the three stars. I think with CJ, I think you're going to see him without the ball as much as you've seen him in the past. I think with B.I., they're going to lean on him more as a point guard. They're pushing him to shoot more three-pointers to kind of not eliminate but to lessen the amount of mid-range jumpers he takes to be more efficient in what he's doing. And I think Zion, I think it's going to be an ongoing conversation. You brought it up before, Zion at the five. And how can they use that as a weapon, not just point Zion, but Zion as a center, as a screener, as an off-ball threat. I think that's what they want to do to kind of – and I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation with this team because uh, what we saw a lot, especially during the times when Zion was out, was B.I. has the ball and everybody's standing around watching him. C.J. has the ball, everybody's standing around watching him. And I think with James Borrego, the emphasis is going to be more off-ball screening, split cuts, you know, running pin downs, running backdoor cuts. Uh, they want to take advantage of the defenses that, that, that kind of puts two, three bodies in front of Zion's way. They want to take advantage of that and use some of their off-ball movement to create easy looks. And, and I think there's going to be some adjustment for guys because this is different than what they've done for the past couple of years under Willie Green. I think that was something Willie Green really wanted to emphasize was to just be less stagnant on offense. And I think that was a big problem for them why they struggled so, so much to produce three-pointers, to produce those easy looks because everybody was just standing around. And I think now they're going to play with a higher pace. They want to get more threes up. They want to have more off-ball movement. And I think that's going to make life easier on the Stars. But a part of that is the Stars, when they don't have the ball, they've got to buy into that mentality. They've got to move. They've got to cut. They've got to set screens. And I think it's different because Zion hasn't done that much in his career. B.I. hasn't done that much in his career. But I think for this offense to be what it needs to be, those guys need to buy into that. And ultimately, it'll make them better. If Zion's screening and getting wide open layups, somebody could because defenses are worried about three point shooters. That's better for Zion. You know, if, if Bi is running pick and roll with Z and he's getting open looks off of that, that's better for Bi. Uh, so I think ultimately they need to buy in, 
and I think they want to buy in, but uh, but really the issue is just very different than what they've done in the past. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that, right? Like, especially with like Brandon Ingram, because it sounds like he, you know, and they were doing it in the first game too. He's essentially the point guard. They kind of want him doing a lot of like that style of play, the final 12 games or so, where he's averaging like 30 points over eight assists per, like he played great basketball then and you Zion off ball, you know, but there are going to be moments when B.I. needs to be off ball, too. And, you know, look at his performances with Team USA. They weren't particularly good, right? Like Anthony Edwards had the ball in his hand. You know, Jim Brunson was just dribbling the air out of the ball the entirety of the time and kind of ignoring B.I., but he largely wasn't a factor in anything. Do you think that so you think that's going to hurt them to start the season? Do you, do you think they'll eventually kind of find that right kind of groove with everything? Yeah, I think it'll be an adjustment, but I think part of it is what you mentioned, that a lot of times B.I. was just a guy standing in the corner with Team USA, and that's very yeah. different than what he's ever been in the NBA. And I think with the key, what James Borrego is trying to get these guys to understand, it just because you don't have the ball, it doesn't mean you're not involved in the play. It doesn't mean that you can't set yourself up to get a shot. And I think so much of what we've seen with this offense is, okay, it's time for me to score, give me the ball. And then I can go it score. was that like I, your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn. Yeah. And it just is very predictable. Yes. It's very predictable. It's stagnant. It results in guys like Herb Jones taking two shots for an entire game. Trey Murphy taking his 10 shots, but they're from the exact same spots on the court every single time. So I think you want guys, uh, you want to be more unpredictable. You want to make the defense focus on those guys away from the ball. And I think, again, it, it's, uh, you, you mentioned it. I think this is going to be an adjustment for B.I. because this team at its best, and especially when games get tight at the end of the game, it's going to be Zion creating with the ball in his hands, right? And, of course, some of that is going to be B.I., but your greatest mismatch creator, your best guy at getting two on the ball is Zion. So that's going to result in B.I. having to figure out how to be more effective away from the ball. But again, I'm going to say it again. Just because you're away from the ball doesn't mean you're not involved in the play. And I think that's going to be the emphasis for this team is you can use those split cuts to get you easy shots. You can run off screens to get easier shots for yourself. And I think with James Borrego, we've seen with his offenses in the past that he can get so many guys involved. You look at those old Charlotte teams that he coached, they had – four or five guys on those teams who would get 30 points on any, any given night because everybody was involved. Everybody was moving. They played at a fast pace. They got up a bunch of threes. So guys were able to get theirs on a random night just because the matchups were right or they hit, hit their first couple shots and got hot. And I think with the Pelicans, it was always B.I.'s got to create every single shot, and the only way Herb Jones is going to get a shot is if B.I. creates it for him. Only way uh, Trey Murphy is going to get an open three is that B.I. creates it. And they, don't, and they don't want that anymore because it's so predictable and easy to defend when you play against some of the best teams in the league. So they want to be uh, more of a, a team that can move away from the ball, get those easy shots. And I think that's when this team can be really dangerous because you already got to put a wall in front of Zion anytime he has the ball. But if you've got to worry about the guys behind that back line as well, then I don't know what you really do as a defense. Yeah, you know, that that's what's I think so interesting about this, right? Like you can make and design a not I, I don't want to necessarily call it a complex offense, right? It's a movement based offense. These are kind of prevalent throughout the NBA, you know, at different levels too. But also you have you know, they, they had those games where they weren't given Zion touches and Willie Green had gave that kind of like what, what the heck quote of like, we haven't put sets and plays in for him. Not that that's hard to do because it's Zion, right? right? Like you just give him the ball. And as you said, two guys are on him every single time. It's not like he is creating through movement. It's just he's creating through pure court gravity and how effective he is with the ball. You know, do you see them? still running things like point Zion like that, where it's just give him the ball on the three point line and let him drive and attack and try and just look, if you don't have it there, kick it to one of the corners and they're putting more of an emphasis on corner three point shooters. You know, you're seeing, you're, you're seeing Herb Jones hit shots from the corner, right? You'll see Jordan Hawkins. We'll talk about that next, probably out there in this game being a spacer, you know, last year they were putting Jackson Hayes in the corner as like your outlet guy. And it seems like at least like that stuff's kind of gone. So if you go back to some of that, just real basic point Zion stuff, at least you have better players around or like more, I don't know, more, more of a plan or something like that, I guess. Right. Yeah. And I think there's no doubt we'll see point Zion again, because it's just so effective. Why, why wouldn't you do it? it right? When the guy is driving <laughs> don't downhill, it. he gets layups every single time. Yeah. And I think you mentioned it. When they are doing that, they want to be mindful of having shooters around him 
mm-hmm. rather than putting the bigs on the court next to him. They'll say, hey, we'll sacrifice a little bit on defense if we can give him the proper spacing on offense. If we can put those shooters around him where not only he can get to his spots in the lane, but he can create those open three-pointers for other guys, and we're confident that they can take those shots. Whereas Jackson Hayes wasn't as comfortable. Billy Hernan Gomez wasn't as comfortable taking those shots. If we put Dyson Daniels in that spot, if we put Jordan Hawkins in that spot, those guys are going to be more comfortable taking those shots. But also, I think, again, being more unpredictable, they want to do more stuff like, hey, uh, what I mentioned in a story I wrote, you know, during the preseason was I think that they're eventually going to start stealing some of the stuff that the Warriors do with Draymond Green, where Draymond Green will catch the ball at the elbow and everybody in the building know he's not going to shoot it. But you still got to guard him because he's able to distribute from that spot. Mm-hmm. And you have those split cuts. You have guys screening on the weak side. And I think they want to use Zion's gravity, like you mentioned, where if he has the ball, you have to have two people in his path. At least. But they're, <laughs> they're only giving him the ball in that spot so he can create a shot for Jordan Hawkins on the weak side. So he can get JV around the basket. And I think they want to do that more often, where at point Zion would always be, all right, give Z the ball and let him run down the middle of the paint and see what he can create. And I think they want to do more of give Z the ball and allow him to create for others. Uh, and I think that will make life easier for him. And again, it'll create more three-pointers, which this team is really emphasizing this year. No, and look, using... Zion off ball, right? And playing him that way, like it's going to protect his body a little bit too, right? Like there's a longevity play in this as well. If he's not driving into three guys at the rim, right? And he's still able to finish and score, you know, maybe get fouled, go to the line. But, you know, we'd like to see him play minimum 65 games, I think is kind of the target number given the end of season awards and everything like that. So using him in those different ways, you know, you would hope he's buying into that because he knows it's the right thing to do for his body, which that's been the big holdup is his career and the injuries. And we've seen him play with that kind of force, right? Like that takes a toll on you, I think, over all of it. So it's going to really be interesting to see how this kind of progresses from, you know, this game against Memphis through the first five games, 10 games, and see if they can really start to find a rhythm So let's talk about the Memphis game coming up here next in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, become an everyday or and listen Monday through Friday. And of course, live show right after the game ends. We're going to be doing it. I'm going to try and even do that on Saturday at the arena. So we're going to be doing a lot of these live shows, instant reactions. Will Smiley, you gonna you going to join me on Saturday in the arena, Will? I'll bring a mic for you. You never know. You never know. You got to keep, keep the people guessing, like the Pelicans. You know, we want to be unpredictable. There you you go. Uh, (laughs) So let's get into the Memphis game. Opening night, you know, injuries on both sides, but Memphis is missing John Morant with the suspension. The news just came out of Steven Adams is going to be out for the season. They're already missing Brandon Clark for the season. I'm feeling like pretty confident in New Orleans to potentially take this one. You know, what are some of the big things you see in this matchup here? Yeah, first off, uh, I... It's just tough because of what in my mind, in my mind, every time I think about the Pels going to Memphis, I think about this is a house of horrors for the Pels. It seems like every time <laughs> they come to Memphis, they just get destroyed by the, the Grizzlies. And whether it's John Moran playing or not, uh, I just think about so many times they came here and got destroyed. This was Memphis was the place where Bi hurt his toe last year. Knock on wood. Yep. Uh, so I think they've got a lot of bad memories in that building, the FedEx Forum, uh, and I think they want to exercise some of those demons. But I also, and I asked Willie Green about this the other day, I think Memphis last year was one of the teams that really uh, employed one of the more effective strategies to defend Zion, and I want to see how much they use that uh, this year, where last year they kind of did the strategy where they used Dylan Brooks as the on-ball defender against Zion, kind of what I call the fire hydrant in front of Zion, and then they would have Jaron Jackson on the back line defending the rim. So it would basically kind of like how the Lakers defended Jokic in the playoffs, right? We have one guy in front of you to make it difficult for you to get to the rim, and then we have a guy waiting for you once you get to the rim, right? Because we know that's where Zion's going every time he has the ball is to the rim, and we know Jaron Jackson is one of the best rim protectors in the NBA. Yep. So they're able to put bodies in front of Zion, and then they have a great shot blocker there waiting for him. So I, I want to see how much Memphis kind of deploys that and how much the Pelicans are able to take advantage of that strategy to create shots for others. Uh, but also, I think you mentioned it that Memphis is going to be missing some of their main big guys. Steven Adams is out. Brandon Clark is out. 
Santi Aldama is on. Maybe a name a lot of people don't know is a really talented young big man uh, for that team. So they're going to be very small in this game. And then you're going against a team where the Pelicans with Zion Williamson and Jonas Valanciunas, one of the biggest front lines in the NBA. They can destroy you on the offensive board. So I want to see how much the Pelicans lean into being big, being physical, dominating the painted area, because that's where they'll have the advantage in this game. Uh, but again, when you talk about Matt Memphis, this is an experienced team. Uh, they, they know how to win without John Morant. They have a great coach in Taylor Jenkins, uh, a lot of really strong defensive players. Uh, so I want to see how they adjust to what the Pelicans are doing and how the Pelicans are able to maintain their core principles, regardless of what Memphis throws at them. Yeah, you know, when I was when I was thinking about this game, right, without Stephen Adams there, and as you mentioned, the strategy they deploy with Jaron Jackson Jr. You know, wh one of his problems though is he he makes some dumb fouls at times. I think he did a, yes. even a little bit with like Team USA. Is this a game where you try and feed Jonas Valanciunas early and see if maybe you can get Jaron Jackson Jr. in a little bit of foul trouble or put a little bit more pressure on him, and then it opens up, you know, maybe the lane for Zion a little bit for Bi for other guys to kind of attack if he's not there as their rim protector. Yeah, I'm not mad at that strategy at all. And I think it's something that a lot of teams are going to do against Memphis because Jaron Jackson is going to be more of a full-time center uh, mm -hmm. without Steven Adams there. And we've seen that's when Jaron Jackson really begins to get in foul trouble is when he's playing more of his minutes at the center. So, yeah, I think uh, that's a strategy we're definitely going to try to see from the Pels is how much they're going to feed Jonas Valanciunas. I can hear Pels' Twitter screaming at me now <laughs> about getting the ball to Jonas, playing him in the fourth quarter, letting him get touches. Uh, I know that was an ongoing topic of, a dis of discussion throughout uh, all of the regular season last year, and I think it's going to continue to be that way in game one. But you're exactly right. that They, they need to try to take advantage of Jared Jackson. And if you can get him on off the court, I think that's – when the floodgates really open for a Zion Williamson, JV, Brandon Ingram, because they just don't have other options coming off the bench. You're talking about Kenny Lofton coming in and trying to protect the rim. <laughs> uh, I mean, it is not a whole lot they got left over there. Uh, we're talking about the injury problems with the Pels. The, the Grizzlies are in a bad spot right now with some of their depth issues. And that, and, and also, they got a brand new point guard and Marcus Smart coming yep. in. And how Who, he who's not adjust. great as like a full-time point guard, right? Like that's kind right, of the issue. Exactly. Like when he's running point for you, like that's not ideal, I don't think, for them. Love him as a player, don't get me wrong, but you don't want Marcus Smart as your full-time starting like field general out there, court general out there with everything, I don't think. Nah, he could be very erratic. His three-point shot could be up and down. He takes risks with the basketball. He, he's, a, he's a guy who can make really good passes, and he's mindful of getting other guys involved. But he's up and down with his decision-making. And I think that that was the case when he was with a Boston team that he played with for years, right? This is a brand mm -hmm. new team, brand new system, brand new teammates. So it's going to be all new for him. And you're catching him in game one before he has time to adjust to all of these things. So I think this is a great opportunity for the Pels to catch Memphis in a really tough spot. Uh, but again, it goes back to what we talked about in the previous segment. They've got to be efficient in what they're doing offensively, and they got to buy in to the system and how it can help them, even though it's very different than what they've done in the past. So how do you see there's injuries? No, no Jose Alvarado, no Trey Murphy, no Najee Marshall here. We know who the starters are. You know, what do you think the rest of the rotation is going to be? Who are the next five guys? Is like Dyson Daniels the first sub in? Is it going to be Larry Nance Jr.? You know, it started to get a little thin kind of kind of fast, it feels like, in this game towards oh. the end of the, the bench right there. Like EJ Liddell minutes in game one. Is that what we're going to see? I wouldn't be shocked if we see a little bit of EJ, especially, you know, if Memphis tries to stay big. Uh, I think for sure you're going to see Dyson Daniels and Kyra Lewis. I think Dyson Daniels <laughs> is a name that I've mentioned in a lot of the, you know, segments I've done leading up to the season. I think he has the potential to really make a jump in year two, just coming in stronger, more confident, spent some time with Team Australia in the summer, uh, spent a lot of time with Fred Vincent making some tweaks to his jumper. Uh, I think he's going to be a much different player, and I think he brings a lot of the assets they want with this team, right? A guy who can play fast, defensive versatility, can pass the ball, uh, unselfish. Uh, I think he does a lot of the things that they want, and I think also I would love to see them lean into these lineups with Herb and Dyson out there together where they could just wreak havoc defensively, scoring transition. 
I would love to see that just because I think those two dudes are so good on defense and they can switch what, the way the Pels want to on the perimeter. Uh, so, yeah, I think Dyson is going to be really big for this team. I think Larry Nance is going to play a prominent role in this first game. Uh, we'll see how much they go to, to Zion at the center, but I think we'll see, still see Larry regardless. And another mention, another name I'll throw out there, call me crazy, Jake, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some Matt Ryan minutes in this first game. If they really? In game one? There. Listen, uh, maybe Jordan Hawkins is that guy. But I think I've said it a million times. They want to shoot more threes this year. They want to space the floor. They want to have those guys who can not only take those shots, but make those shots. And I think Jordan Hawkins, I've been more on the skeptical side of Jordan Hawkins as a contributor in year one, just because I think he's still got to put on some muscle. His shot has been up and down during the preseason and summer mm-hmm. league. I still think he's figuring out how to play this style of basketball versus what he was asked to do in UConn. And I think uh, it might take him some time to really just understand his role and be comfortable in his role. And it wouldn't be, it wouldn't shock me if you see a little bit of Matt Ryan taking some shots out there. Uh, and I, it'll, it'll be weird seeing. Like, I tweeted this. It'll be weird seeing New Orleans forward Matt Ryan. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it wouldn't shock me. I'll tell you that much. That. I was not expecting that at all. Like when you were like, Jake, I'm going to throw a curveball at you there. I had no clue what you were going to say. It was also most definitely not expecting to see Matt Ryan's name come up. No, but that's interesting, right? Like this team also does have a history of basically like signing guys day of and then either starting them or playing them significant minutes over the past like 10 years with and this. having success with two-way contracts, right? Yeah, no, they've, they've got a ton of that. Look, going back to Kenrich Williams, who's no longer here, but is a you know solid NBA player in a sense. So, you know, when they signed him, I think it was a little bit of a surprise over someone like Trey Jemison, who I think a lot of people were maybe expecting and liked what they saw from him in preseason. So if they feel this is the right guy, I think it's you, you trust the team with it. I'll, I think that'll be really interesting to see. But yeah, if it's if they don't think Hawkins is ready, you know, throw the guy in who who burned you at least once last year, I guess. So, you know, I don't think, I think Pels fans still aren't over that one yet. No, they're most definitely not. (laughs) On the show I did about it, everyone was like, yeah, I hate this dude, but like, fine, whatever. He's on the Pelicans. We'll, we'll eventually forgive him for, for last season. But it wasn't like you're on the team. All's good. It was like, nah, screw you dude a little bit still, which fair enough here. So before we wrap up, do you, do you have like a season prediction or is it, you know, say assume slightly above average health for this team, right? Like Zion's playing 60, 65, same for BI. Where do you think this team kind of falls in the Western conference? No, I've said it consistently. I think if B.I. and Zion can give you 60-plus games, I think it's going to be one of the better teams in the Western Conference. I think they'll be above that play-in line. They're going to be right around that 4, 5, 6 area. It wouldn't shock me if they're fighting for home court advantage up there in the West. A lot of that – I mean, the entire West is going to be dependent upon injuries, not just the Pelicans. I think it's just so deep. There are so many good teams in the West. They're going to be at least two or three teams that will fall off just based off on injuries. So I think uh, if you can be one of those teams who can avoid that, that would help. But uh, we've seen it, you know, over the years when Zion Williamson plays, this team is very, very good, and they're very, it's really very that hard simple. To yeah, and so if he's out there, they'll be one of the better teams in the West. And I think I, I've said this before: if they can find a way to get Zion Williamson on the playoff stage, I think it'll be fascinating, just because he's so hard to stop. And I think people have forgotten this, just because it's been so long since he played in big games. What we've seen previously with Zion in big games is that dude shows up. He's not afraid of the big stage. He's not afraid of the bright light. So I think him on the playoff stage, I think he can do some crazy things, especially if you get them in the right matchup. Like if they can catch like a Golden State Warriors where they're a very small team, or you can catch somebody like that where the matchups are right and and it allows Zion to take advantage of some of his strengths. I I think this could be a really dangerous team because we've seen B.I. We know he can show up on the playoff stage. C.J.'s got a long track and on the playoffs. If you can throw Zion in that mix as well, uh, this team can be really dangerous. But let's say it for the umpteenth time, you got to be healthy. 
got to be healthy. It really like, look, our jobs are like so simple right now, right? We could just reduce <laughs> it down to like, if they're healthy, they're good, you know, and my show's done. And like, there's your article written in and, and all, all of those things, right? Uh, well, I appreciate you taking the time here. Everyone follow him on Twitter at Will Guillory. That's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Pelicans. Enjoy the game tonight. Make sure to jump on YouTube with me right after the game ends. We're going to go live. I'll take your questions, interact with y'all, give you the instant reaction. This has been the Locked on Pelicans podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.